Good afternoon and welcome to today's EHS Today webcast, Human-Robot Collaboration Essentials, Risk Assessment and Validation, sponsored by PILD Automation Safety. My name is Stephanie Valentic, Associate Editor of EHS Today. Before we begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First, if at any time you are having audio difficulties or slides are not advancing, simply hit your F5 key to refresh your webcast console. If you have any technical difficulties during today's session, please press the Help button on your player council to receive assistance in solving common issues. This webinar technology allows you to resize the presentation by clicking the Maximize icon or by dragging the lower right corner to enlarge the window. We welcome your questions during today's event. To submit your questions to today's presenter, simply type your question into the Q&A window on the left side of your screen and hit the Submit button. We'll be answering as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation, but please feel free to send in your questions at any time and we'll add them to the queue. Please also be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the AHS Today website within the next week for you to review. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. The PILS logo on your council is hotlinked. If you would like to visit their website during the webcast, you can click on the logo and a new window will open. This will not take you out of the event. And now I would like to welcome our presenter. Elena Dominguez is a safety consultant in machinery safeguarding with 25 years prior experience in robotic integration and 20 years on U.S. and International Robot Safety Standards Subcommittee and has been working with PILS Automation Safety since 2007. Elena, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, this presentation is on collaborative robots and the benefits and safety. So I'm Elena Dominguez, and um, thank you for this time to speak to you. In the presentation, I want to cover certain objectives. I wanted to highlight the types of HRC methods that are there highlight the benefits of HRC robotics for people who are looking at that, describe the unique hazards that are introduced when we have human-robot collaboration systems, talk about the uh, unique requirements for a risk assessment covering HRC, identify body region exposure uh, and force and contact pressure um, elements of the risk assessment that become important. Look at risk reduction measures for limiting um, forces when we're doing force pre limiting applications. And then finally talk about validation of the system. So what is collaborative operation? Uh, it, for me, it is allowing persons to access a robot while the servo power is on the motors are, are, are energized so the robot can move. The robot is, in fact, in automatic operation. So from signals, it can be, uh, the, the movement can be initiated. And the robot is actually executing this, its program. This is totally different than the traditional robot system where you were entering in a fence with an interlock switch and the robot shut down. and. Uh, the robot was, did not have power, was not an automatic uh, operation, and was not executing its program. Also, the robot may uh, stop and then restart on its own automatically, or it may just keep moving when you approach the robot and reach around into the collaborative space. So there's two types of collaborative operation. Each has its a different degree of interaction with personnel. On the left, I show a shared workspace. I think a lot of people think of that when they think of collaborative robots. So robot and a person working together within the same workspace, so we call a shared workspace. Here you have high interaction with the robot, a high potential for contact with the robot. In addition, there's other people that might go in for certain tasks, and there's other people that'll be standing by, nearby, that could approach. Now, the most common application today is not that high interaction. It is something we call coexisting, coexisting with separate workspaces. In this situation, the robot has a work area, and there is no person assigned to work there uh, con constantly during the day. However, you do have some interaction. People still come in 
for minor servicing, for setup, for cleaning. So there is interaction, just not to the same degree as in the collaborative uh, or cooperative uh, operations. There are four methods, and they are described in the ISO TS 15066, and this is the SMS, the Safety Rated Monitored Stop Operation, with, where someone approaches the robot and is held, it is held in a stopped position, again with motors on, and the robot program executing. A simple example would be an application where someone brings in a part and loads it directly to the tool on, at the end of the robot arm. In this case, the person enters in and is sensed by some present sensing device, most commonly a laser scanner. And that area is shown in the black and yellow. So when the robot is in that space at the same time that the person is, the robot is going to be held in the safe monitored stop and cannot move. If it does try to move, it will shut down into a power off condition. Now a variation to that is method number two, hand guiding. In this situation, the robot is stopped when somebody approaches it, but can be caused to move when someone grabs a control device on, mounted on the tool, whether it's a joystick or a set of buttons or levers, it, uh, the robot can be caused to move uh, as the person uh, moves a control device. This is uh, an application where the robot may handle a heavy part and the person acts as the final locating um, guide. Uh, the person would be the eyes for the robot and provide the final direction and location of the part as the robot uh, sets it down. So this is a pretty uh, expensive uh, a lift assess system, but uh, it, it, uh, there are some applications where this is very beneficial to do. Method, whoops, method number three is speed and separation monitoring. In speed and separation monitoring, what we do is we have the robot in, a, in the collaborative zone and people can approach it and as they get closer to the robot, the robot will start slowing down or taking evasive action and if the person gets too close to the robot to, a, to within a distance that the robot could not, has to stop before it has the inability to stop in time, the, the robot will come to a, a safe stop and probably uh, either power down or go to a safe monitored stop. So this, is, this application is very complex. You require a lot of uh, sensing, a lot of data uh, being manipulated at real time to track uh, the robot position and to monitor where people are uh, walking into the space. And it has to be done at a safety rated level. Therefore, at this point in industry, there are no uh, speed and separation monitoring systems in production. However, there is a lot of research and there's companies that are exploring this to bring production ready, safety rated systems to the market. But we're waiting for that one. So you can see here an application where we have a vision system up in, up in the air, uh, up in the steel of the building, looking down and creating a sensing field around the robot. If somebody comes in, the robot then is, um, is affected in terms of its speed and movement. Uh, that's on the left-hand side there. On the right-hand side is another application that was a research um, project where robots were working with people and there was, again, sensing all around, but in that case, it was uh, different types of sensors. Now, the fourth method is power and force limiting. I think this is the one most people think of today when they think of collaborative robots. It is the one system that is being implemented uh, in increasingly high numbers. This is where someone can enter the space where the robot is operating and the robot can continue to move should there be 
unintentional or intentional contact with the robot. The robot is designed such that the forces imparted onto the person are below limits that would cause an injury. So there's a number of different robots on the market. You can see here we have a universal robot that's uh, pressing down on a um, inner seal of an automotive door while people are working nearby. This is a good example of a coexisting robot. The um, the four methods that we've identified are frequently combined in an application. So when you think of a collaborative operation, don't think of one method. Think of how can I use the four methods to implement my collaborative system. In this, in this example, we have a combination of safe monitored stop and power and force limiting. Safe monitored stop is being implemented in a very rudimentary um, way. You have a laser scanner, the sensing field shown in red. And when somebody approaches the robot, it goes from a high speed move to a slow speed move, a move that would be considered safe should there be impact. And the robot will continue running as the person approaches. And if the person uh, makes contact with the robot, the robot is then operating at a force limited condition. So we use two different um, types of method, methods of collaborative operation in this application. So we have the four methods here. And you'll see here from this chart that methods one, two, and three um, safe monitored stop, hand guiding, and speed and separation monitoring can be done with traditional style robots as long as they have the proper software uh, installed with the proper safety rated safety functions in place to give them the uh, characteristics necessary for that operation. The fourth type, the type method four, which is power and force limiting, this is a new robot application because in this situation, people are exposed to a moving robot and in fact may be contacted by that same moving robot. So this is totally different in the industry now uh, and uh, is very useful in, in the applications today. Examples of this force limited robot come in different uh, types. Here is a ABB robot, it's a two-arm robot, and we consider this an inherently safe operation for power and force limiting, where the robot has motors and gearing such that the speeds attained and the forces imparted will always be within the biomechanical limits defined by the standard. Other robots do this through the control system, the sophisticated control system that looks at the position of the arm, the torque on the motors, and uh, the resulting forces that it's imparting to make sure they stay within a limit. So here we have the KUKA uh, lightweight ro robot, the EVA. Uh, we have the universal robot, which is three sizes now. And again, uh, you see that same uh, automotive door on the left and a valve insertion onto an engine head on the right. Uh, FANUC has a slight different take here. Instead of monitoring torques and position of the robot arm, instead the entire robot is mounted on the load cell and the robot um, controls its force by looking at the reactive forces that are imparted on the floor going through that load cell. So very effective. None of these robots are perfect. There's there's uh, situations where you can still create some hazards, but for the most part, they can be effectively implemented in a compliant system. Now, why do we want to use collaborative robots? Well, uh, I think one advantage is quite obvious is the fact that if I can implement a collaborative robot and avoid the perimeter guarding, then I'm going to save the cost of that perimeter guarding, save the cost of doors and interlock switches, of tunnels, of, uh, of light curtains, and other perimeter guarding devices that are in place. I think the biggest uh, advantage, though, is floor space savings. On, on the top, I have a cell showing the footprint of the robot with traditional guarding and below I have 
changed it to a tradition to a new collaborative robot application. And you see that the cell is narrower because of the fact that I don't need the extra space for doors and tunnels and safe dis approach distances for present sensing devices. They can be shoulder to shoulder to people on the assembly line. I think uh, one of the biggest challenges in any uh, automation application is having the right, the sufficient real estate to implement something. And so this opens up the door to many, many robot applications. So uh, it is it is possible to install these small robots where you have high labor uh, um, density. You have a lot of people working in an area, then you can fit these robots into that same footprint as the person. And I think a very interesting thing that's unique to collaboratives is a concept we are calling partial automation. You can look at an application where you have people doing an assembly job, uh, a finishing job, something on uh, where the footprint is set because the machinery is designed and you want to put some robots in. Uh, sometimes you have tasks done by people that are easy to automate. And sometimes you do not. The person brings in a human touch, whether it's the feel, the manipul the dexterity of their hands, the uh, variations of the parts to where it's not an easy thing to automate. With collaborative robots, since they're fitting into the same workspace as the person, you can select which stations you can automate and leave the person in, the, in their space where a robot cannot do the job and maintain the overall same footprint of the cell. So I think this is a big bonus in trying to find applications that couldn't be done before. Instead of having to redo the entire process, you just bring in the robots in the areas where they fit. Now, why? what gives us the ability to do these and be compliant with standards? The, uh, the robot safety standards um, have been updated to include collaborative robot operation. Initially, it was the ISO 10218 in 2011. Uh, the US standard, the R1506, uh, that's been around since 1986, was updated in 2012 to include this also. So you can implement a collaborative robot system in one of the four methods that I presented and be compliant with the current robot safety standards. In addition, there's two very interesting standards down below. You have the ISO TS 15066 and its corresponding um, R1506 TR R15.606 standard. They're identical standards. This one is published by ISO. The other is published by RIA. But it gives you further guidance in implementing collaborative robots. And there's a new technical report that I thought was released, but it might still be in the process of being released. It is the anti RIA TR R15.806, and it provides test guidance on test, test methods for collaborative operations. So it provides you further guidance on how you would go about measuring forces and contact pressures to validate your system. So as we go into a risk assessment, uh, the thing we find out is we have new hazards that are present in the system. We have now uh, gone from a traditional system to a system with no fencing. And what that does is it, it exposes people, it exposes the operators to a robot movement and permits them to interact with that robot. So in your risk assessment, you have to consider both intentional contact with the robot and unintentional contact. At the end of the day, it has to be safe. So we're looking at robot motion hazards. We can have impact where the robot is moving through through space and someone gets in the path and gets hit. We can have, we can have crush hazards where the robot is moving and pin somebody against a fixed structure, whether it's a fixture that the robot is working at or some other structure in the area. The robot itself can present some hazards. Um, there may be positions where the robot arm 
uh, causes a crush hazard, such as in the elbow area shown in this diagram. And the tool itself could present hazards if you're carrying a gripper. No, you could be crushed by that gripper if you stick your hands in the jaws as they're closing. So let's go into details on the risk assessment. Uh, here's a, a typical example of a collaborative robot cell where we're using a robot to palletize parts that are coming in on a conveyor. The key step in um, collaborative robot risk assessment is to identify the potential robot contact points. So in this example, I looked at uh, where might someone get caught up and uh, either have a crush hazard or a impact hazard. Now in the standard, they don't use crush and impact. They use quasi-static and transient contact events. And we'll go into more detail there. But you can see every place I have the blue hexagon, I, I'm showing that I've identified a potential contact point with the robot that has to be assessed in my risk assessment. You can see you have to, it's a three-dimensional thing here. So here's a side view of those same uh, contact points. Just to make an example, if the robot is moving apart uh, towards the pallet, I can get stuck and crushed under the part as it's being placed in the pallet. As the robot is swinging back and forth between the pallet and the pickup point, I can have a transient contact uh, with the robot and arm as it's moving through space. You can see con uh, potential contacts three and five show transient uh, as it swings back and forth. And the others show crush hazards or quasi-static contact events at different points. So one important thing in collaborative robot operations, you must reduce the risk of head, neck, and face uh, contact. This is a very sensitive area. Nobody wants to be smacked in the face. So in your application, you must take that into account and design the system so that the event of someone being struck in the head or in the face is an acceptable risk level, meaning that it's not impossible, but it must be a very, very low probability with a lower, a lower end range of severity potential. So let's talk about the risk assessment further. Uh, and typical risk assessments in robotics, we look at task and hazard. So look at, let's look at one task and one hazard to look at the risk involved here. A task here is to unjam uh, a part as it's being loaded onto the pallet. Uh, as you know, all machines will need some interaction though and then something goes wrong, whether the part slipped out of the gripper and jammed up and was, as it was being placed. Maybe the part was put down and it kind of rolled out of position and the robot left and you want to go in there and straighten it out. So one hazard is that you're reaching in and the robot comes back with a part in its gripper and crushes your hand against the parts below. In the risk assessment, we try to determine what the risk level is and this is the bills of, this is the PILS numerical risk assessment. Don't get hung up on this methodology. It's simply an example. You can use your own methodology. But in this methodology, we assign numbers to four different aspects. We have the potential degree of harm, in this case, for the given size robot I have. If the robot was not force limited, I could see a broken finger potential, so I apply a three. The frequency of exposure is, is estimated to be every two hours, so I'll apply an hourly value of four for the EF uh, variable. I would put a 2.5 on the possibility of avoidance, saying that it is possible to avoid it under certain conditions. If I'm facing it, if I'm seeing it coming at me, I can definitely avoid it. The probability of the hazardous event occurring. In this case, that the force limit that's in the robot would fail. The force limit is at a performance level D, which is a very reliable safety rated level. Therefore, the factor is 0.05, which is almost impossible. If I multiply these all through out, three times four times 2.5 times 0 0.05, I get a value of 1.5. And in the range for this particular methodology, it is 
considered a negligible risk. Therefore, I can run this robot and the risk of someone being crushed under that part is acceptable because it's, it is a negligible level of risk. However, in order for that to be true, two things have to be done. Number one, the force control has to be reliable, and number two, the contact has to stay below the pain threshold values that are in the standard. So let's look at that a little closer. ISO 13849 defines the circuit performance of a safety function. And essentially, what we're saying here, if I'm depending on this force limiting function, how reliable should it be? What's the chance that uh, it'll fail and how low should that chance be? I apply the graph here and I take three uh, conditions. S2 meaning that it is a potential severe injury. F2 meaning that it's a frequent exposure. But P1 meaning that there is some degree of avoidability. This graph says, therefore, I should make sure that the circuit performance of the risk reduction should be performance level D. Now, the other aspect, as I said, we want to make sure that nobody is injured uh, at the force limit that we set. And what we do is we apply the concepts of pain and minor injury threshold. You can see the green line below is a point of sensation. As the robot's starting to touch you, you feel that it's touching you as the force increases at some point, you're going to start feeling pain. And if, as it increases further, at, at some point, you're going to reach a minor injury threshold, in which case this is defined by minor lacerations, uh, something that's not going to require stitches, something that you can put a Band-Aid on, or a contusion, a bruise, that will clear up in a few days. So, so our goal is to make sure we stay under the red line to do that, we design to the yellow line. So there's three bio, biomechanical limits that are in the standard. Quasi-static force and pressure. Remember, quasi-static is a crushing force or sustained force. Transient is an impact force, so it's a very short, momentary force. There's limits for that. And then there's limits for energy. Energy flux, in fact. The amount of energy you you impart through a certain area size. So for quasi-static contact events, as I said before, what we're looking at here is a fact that we have contact with the robot that's constrained. We are pushing someone against a fixed um, structure. And if we look at the graph on the right, you see the red line is a, is a force curve. It shows that the robot will have a peak. Most of the time they do, and that's from the momentum of the arm that's striking your hand. And then it'll settle down to a sustained force as the robot keeps trying to push down. They don't all look like this. In fact, sometimes a quasi-static event will look similar to a transient event if the robot withdraws. So for a transient event, as the robot goes through and it strikes, strikes me as it's going through its path, the, the force will be momentary because it's going to strike the person and the person is going to move away. This is an unconstrained contact event in free space. So we need to know what type of contact event occurs because we need to know that to pick the right biomechanical limit. In ISO TS15066, it has a table that, that gives values for quasi-static and transient contact based on different points of the body. You can see the body model there in the lower right shows 29 points where values are given. And it depends on where that robot is striking you. If it strikes you on the hand, you want to know how much the hand can take before you exceed those limits of minor threshold of injury. So. As we look closer at the table, we see that, for example, if we go down to the bottom, it says lower arm and wrist joints. There are three different points that were measured on that or, or values given. Under quasi-static, we have two columns. One is contact pressure, so it's newtons per centimeter squared. And uh, the, the column on the right under quasi-static is forces. 
So in order to avoid an injury, we have two properties we have to meet. Number one, we have to make sure that the force that's imparted is no more than 160 newtons, and that the contact pressure that's being felt by the skin where the, con where the uh, robot is striking does not exceed these values of 180, 180, and 190 newtons per centimeter squared. Now, because this is quasi-static, uh, it, it has a certain value, but for transient, where the peak is very short, it has to be less than, uh, no more than half a second, the limits are actually double. So if I go to the permissible force on the transient, where before I had 160 for quasi-static, I multiply times two, so I have 320 newtons for a transient contact event, and the same doubling of the limits goes for the the contact pressure. So here is the remainder of the table. It also covers hands and lower legs, and you can see that there is still that factor of two uh, for the transient compared to the quasi-static. So back to my example, somebody sticks their hand underneath the robot that's it's bringing the part over. You have to ask yourself what body regions are exposed. Nine times out of 10, it seems like I'm looking at fingers, hands, and arms. Why? Because we use them so much and we stick them out to do the task that we're expecting. So what I would do is I would have to determine, am I exceeding the force and pressure? For the pressure, uh, when you're at the design phase, you can look at the contact area that's going to be contacting uh, the smallest feature of the exposed body region, in this case, a small finger. And you could, you could predict uh, where you might be in terms of contact pressure. In this case, I have a robot delivering 150 newtons. The area that's being uh, uh, contacted to a small finger is estimated to be point seven centimeters squared, I divide 150 by 0 0.7, I get 214 newtons per centimeter squared. So keep in mind that this contact area can be influenced by the body shape and by the tool, not just by the tool. So if I look at the uh, areas or the limits that are uh, related to this particular contact event, I can see a lot of red, meaning that I am exceeding uh, contact pressures and contact forces, given that I'm looking at 150 newtons and 214 newtons per centimeter squared. So I have to change something. So what you can do with a collaborative robot that's power and force limited by control, you can typically go to a safety configuration uh, screen on the robot teach pendant and adjust the parameters. In this case, let's say we lower the available force from 150 newtons down to 100 newtons. Given the same contact pressure and the same, same exposed body region, this would bring me into the green on all the uh, exposed body regions, meaning that I would be compliant for this particular risk uh, source. Therefore, having a performance level D control uh, function and having the force and contact pressure within the biomechanical limits, I in fact do have a negligible risk level. Now sometimes you can't just pick up the pen and make adjustments. There's other things you have to take into account. Uh, one here is uh, the design of the tooling itself and the robot. Uh, sometimes you, you have to uh, redesign the tool to eliminate concentration points of contact pressure. So um, sometimes you can redesign and remachine the tools to have nice rounded edges, no blind holes where people can get trapped, uh, no sharp corners on it. Uh, you may have components that you can't machine, therefore you have to either put padding or make them resilient by putting springs so that they collapse or they float. Uh, there's a number of, of passive measures that can be done. Sometimes you have to, uh, you cannot change the motions of the robot or re or machine the robot. It's still too hard, too high a, a force or contact pressure. In this case, let's say we have a high force uh, where the robot 
elbow area is, and I cannot limit that motion, then I might choose to put some kind of sensing device that will shut it down. So in this case, I put tactile covering on it. It's like a safety mat wrapped around the robot arm. If somebody sticks their arm in that elbow area and the robot collapses down to the arm, it will shut down. Now, a transient contact events are hard to measure. Uh, so a different approach instead of forces and contact pressures for uh, transient events is to look at it from an energy level. And so we can define a speed limit that would keep those contact forces and contact pressures within the limits if we follow the guidelines here from this table, in table 4A in the ISO 10 to the ISO TS15066. It gives energy levels um, per centimeter squared uh, to be imposed on different body regions. To do that, we have to look at the robot and the moving part of it. Sometimes it's not always the entire arm, but a, a worst case situation, you would say, let's look at the robot, that part that's moving, and the tool on the end of the arm and the part that we're carrying. There's a simple equation that you would uh, plug the data into. Uh, in this example, I have a, um, a UR robot that weighs 28.9 kilograms. However, uh, an estimate of what uh, or of the moving arm is only 23.1 because the base is bolted to the table and doesn't move. So the moving portion of the arm is approximately 23 kilograms. If I have a payload of 5 kilograms, which includes the tool and the part that it's carrying, in this formula it says that the effective mass of the robot arm is 16.6 .6 kilograms, meaning that's what I'm going to feel when it strikes me. Now, you, there's a table in there, a graph, and with a family of curves for different body regions. Most of the time I look at the chest contact, which is the lowest, uh, the lowest curve on there. And if you look at that, we have, uh, if I go up from 16 kilograms up to the lowest line on there, which is for uh, chest, you can see that the pay, the limit for speed is 450 millimeters per second. Now, finally, in a risk assessment, we have to take care of the residual risk by providing administrative measures, and in this case, awareness measures that will that uh, uh, are required. We have to delineate where the robot is moving, so we're restricting the space of the robot, and that down from its maximum space down to its restricted space using safety rated uh, boundaries. We also put up a sign to uh, make sure that uh, the that people are aware that there's a collaborative robot in here. We put up a mandatory safety glasses symbol up there so when people go in they know that they have they have to wear safety glasses because even at the forces that we limit uh, you may still have injury to the eyes. So to wrap things up here, we, the last step we have to take is validation. Just like any safety system that you have on the machine that you're about to introduce into production, you want to make sure that all the safety functions, all the safety devices, uh, all the present sensing devices, all the guards are in implemented effectively. And in this case, what we have is we have force limits for power and force limited robot that we have to make sure are keeping the forces and contact pressures below the limits. So we have to measure forces. We have to either analyze or measure contact pressures. We have to make sure that we've addressed all the essential body regions that are exposed and their particular limits. And we also want to make sure that we're respecting the speed limits that we need for ourselves. One way to do this is to have a collision measurement system. PILS has one called the PRMS. It is, it, is a, it is a digital force gauge and a uh, contact film measurement system. So we can measure forces and contact pressures uh, for the different 
areas that we identified in the risk assessment, remember the first step was to identify potential contact points. At those different points, we're going to make measurements and we're going to want to confirm, that's what validation means, we want to confirm that all those uh, forces and contact pressures are below the biomechanical limits for the body regions being contacted. When we take a force measurement, we position the force gauge within the path of the robot, we take a measurement, we collect the data in the laptop that's hooked up to the measurement device, and we have a curve, a force, a force curve where we can compare uh, that force curve to the limits. And you can see here the blue line is the force. It's a very short duration. The pulse is uh, less than 100 milliseconds, therefore we know it's transient. The red line uh, has uh, two steps. The upper one is the transient level. Uh, limit, the lower one is the quasi-static limit. You can see we're well below the limits. In addition, for contact pressure, we take a special film uh, that is a pressure-sensitive film that we apply on top of the uh, force gauge. So we can actually do this at the same time, measure force and measure contact pressure at the same time. When the robot strikes the force gauge, the contact surfaces create the contact pressure against the film and we analyze the film through a scanner and some software and we can determine what the contact pressures are actually are and we can look and see if we're within the limits if we have any sharp edges we have to take care of we need to add some padding we can identify that through this analysis now keep in mind that uh, as you go through a robot system uh, you go through different phases and field is in a position to support you in those if you look at uh, the initial concepts at the design level, you, you, you pick the right application. Maybe you want to build a prototype and do some testing there, uh, get ready. Uh, then you go into a risk assessment of your final configuration. Um, you may have to, you have to then take the con safety concepts that you're going into. Maybe it's just one method of collaborative operation. Maybe you can combine different methods then you engineer it, then you have to validate it. Uh, so, so we can be involved in all those different areas. We can also provide training to help your people understand uh, what it takes to comply. And if you're shipping to Europe, we can assist in CE marking. So this is my talk. Uh, I appreciate that. And we're gonna go into the questions now and let's hope that uh, I can answer them all. And if we don't get to them, then I will I'll get back to you in writing on, on questions that weren't on, uh, answered. Thank you so much for your time. Let's go to the questions. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. Um, a few of you have already submitted questions, so we're going to jump right in. Um, today's PDF is available on the uh, on your toolbar. Your uh, so if you would like to download that as well, it is available. Um, so our first question is, what is OSHA's current opinion on collaborative robots? Ah, so so uh, I've had this uh, question asked to me by uh, customers because uh, the traditional robots had fences around them, and now OSHA uh, is going to see robots without fences. The good news is that the RIA has been in, uh, working with the uh, the OSHA administration and providing them with training, and they formed an alliance. So the official stance from OSHA, I believe, is that a robot without a fence is going to be fine as long as it's compliant with collaborative robot safety standards. So uh, we've made a big, big uh, improvement there. Next question. Okay. Uh, what is the best way to measure contact pressure at various points on the row ballot? Yeah, well, it, it's going to take some experience to try to decide how to position the transducers to, to make the measurements. Uh, a lot of times it's, it's pretty straightforward. You, you have a fixture and the robot's coming down onto it, so you place the force gauge on top of the fixture and let the robot hit it. Sometimes you have to modify the program so that you can um, position the, 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 the device and uh, have the robot hit it uh, as it's moving through space to to another position. So there's there's the main thing is that you have a good uh, uh, 
uh, measurement device that's calibrated and and providing data that's uh, plotted against time so that you can identify the contact event. But uh, uh, those techniques are, are constantly being uh, um, evolving. There's a new technical standard or technical report issued by the RIA called the TRR15.808, and that's providing some new guidance for measurement. And uh, if you're going to be doing measurements, you need to get a hold of that technical report and see if you can apply the, the guidance in there. Next, next one. Okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, what are the qualifications for taking force measurements? Yes. So, so when you're taking force measurements, it's, it's important that you do it right. So uh, whoever is going to be doing the measurements, they got to be able to obviously know how to use the measurement tool. So they have to be trained in it to understand the, 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 uh, the quantities that they're measuring of force and contact pressure. They should be aware of the guidance in the standards. And specifically, I mentioned this technical report, the 15.808 report. And uh, make sure that you comply with the guidelines in there. And it talks about uh, things such as uh, making sure your device is within calibration, that uh, you're positioning device in, in uh, position that's normal to the path of the robot because typical force measurement devices are a single dimensional measurement device uh, that you um, that you make conversions or you see you handle dynamic uh, uh, force measurement uh, appropriately because it's going to be different from the quasi static uh, forces that you measure so transient and quasi static are different different types of of uh, setups that you have to go through but make sure that the person is properly trained. And if it's your first system, seek out some experience uh, support through, say, a third-party um, source to set through it the first time so that you can get to help them uh, get some experience for your own people in making measurements. Okay, next one. Okay. Uh, when calculating the pressure applied by the robot, do you need to consider the worst-case scenario? For example, if the robot dropped the part and went through the cycle without the part, it could just then crush a, crush a finger with the edge of the gripper, which would have a much lower surface area and therefore higher pressure. Yeah, in your risk assessment, you're going to make those decisions. You always have to ask yourself, is there a worst-case condition that I have to measure, or is that worst-case sufficiently uh, re possibility of it sufficiently reduced with with what I have uh, done with the system. So typically, a robot gripper properly designed isn't going to be dropping parts. It's specifically since it has to be designed so that it won't release a part with a loss of energy or an emergency stop. However, if you have an application where you are aware that that possibility is is more than slight, then yeah, by all means you'll want to measure it. Uh, other other instances, the worst case are speed. If the robot's approaching a fixture at, at 150 millimeters a second just, um, within the contact zone before it slows down, you obviously you want to measure at that point. But if the robot has the potential for going a lot faster, then you have to consider whether you want to measure even faster speeds at that point. It's a judgment you make at the risk assessment uh, to determine uh, what are what is the risk of the cell, and if a worst case influences that risk, then you need to measure it. Next question. Okay. Um, how do you factor in human movement, example, a person walking into the robot versus stationary? Yeah, that's an important thing here. As soon as we eliminate fences, you have the human element, and the human element means that a person can come in and do the oddest thing, move in the, the strangest poses. So in any collaborative robot application where you have movement, in the specifically power and force limited, you have to make sure that the risk generated by someone taking an odd uh, posture is still within a tolerable range. And uh, so uh, the way I, I look at it is two ways. One, you want to minimize the possibility that the person will assume those odd postures that put their head and face in in uh, path of the robot. So don't design in any task that the person is required to do 
that is within the path of the robot uh, where they position their head. Let's say you don't want them bending over to pick up something routinely that puts their head in the path of the robot. Secondly, you want to make sure that you look at motivations for that, that you that you say, what might this person do even if I tell them not to do it? And you may have to do things like put up uh, awareness barriers that prevent the person from bending over right into the path, or maybe you need some clear barriers in certain spots to keep them from bending over, um, and obviously training. But uh, you can't eliminate it. You have to reduce the possibility to where you feel you have an acceptable level of risk. Next, next question. Does OSHA accept collaborative robot systems without safety fencing? Yeah, as, as I answered in my first question, uh, OSHA has, uh, we've been able to uh, present our case to OSHA and form an alliance with them to update their compliance officers uh, uh, and to incorporate uh, the collaborative robots in the training material that they have. They have, uh, they, 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 uh, have accepted that a properly uh, integrated robot cell that's compliant with the guidance of the collaborative robot safety standards can be construed as a system that's properly safeguarded. So, uh, a uh, compliance officer shouldn't come in and automatically cite you because there's a robot without a fence. But at the same time, you better be ready with the right answers to, to explain that you are in compliance. You did do your risk assessment. You did confirm that the forces and contact pressures and speeds are within the limits. So that's, that, so it's a two-way street, but uh, you should be able to implement collaborative robots and not be cited by OSHA. All right. Um, it actually looks like we're about out of time right now. If we did not get to your question, um, everything will be passed along to our presenter. Um, I would like to t thank our presenter and our sponsor, Pills Automation Safety. As a reminder, if you're registered as a group, please add the names and emails of all in attendance on the exit survey. On behalf of EHS Today, have a productive remainder of the day.